You're listening to the My Simplified Life podcast, and this is episode number 128. Welcome to the My Simplified Life podcast, a place where you will learn that your past and even your present don't define your future. Regardless of what stage of life you're in, I want you to feel inspired and encouraged to pursue your dreams, simplify your life, and start taking action today. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac, and I'm excited to share my stories and life lessons with you while taking you on my own journey. This is my simplified life. Hi, friends. Welcome to another episode. I'm your host, Michelle Glogovac. With all that is going on in our world, feeling anxious seems like a daily occurrence. For some, anxiety is something that enters our lives at a very early age, and without tools, professional help, and more, it may never exit. My guest today is Dr. Robin Graham, and yes, she might sound familiar because Robin has been a previous guest, but today she's adding author as a title to her name. Robin's book, You, Me, and Anxiety, launches into the world today. It's a book about Robin's experience with anxiety and a guide for teen girls on how they can navigate anxiety in their lives. I was lucky enough to read the parent edition, which includes everything in the teen book, but also helps guide parents as they go on their journey with their daughter. I personally feel this book is one that can can be and should be read by more than teen girls. You'll hear how, as I was reading the book, I was able to utilize some of Robin's tools in my own household and with my children. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Robin as much as I did, because I think it's very important that we learn to deal with anxiety early on and to destigmatize it along with all other mental health diagnoses. Hello, Robin. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I feel like I should be calling you Dr. Graham. Oh, that's okay. We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> no formalities. I, I love that you are using the doctor title that you rightfully, you know, worked for, own, and are in your new book that launches today. Well, thank you. <laughs> I you, know it- me, and anxiety is out today. I'm so excited for you. Happy launch day. Thank you. I am so excited too. And and I can't even tell you how grateful I am that I get to share this special day with you, that oh. you have embraced this journey with me and are supporting me. Just this means the world to me. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. It's beyond my pleasure. I'm so honored that I got to read it before it came out today and to you know see you go through this process. It's just, it's amazing. Before we jump too far in, even though you've been a guest on the show before, <laughs> can you take a moment to introduce yourself to everyone? Sure. So as you said, my name is Robin Graham. I am a brand strategist and business coach, and I help female entrepreneurs build a personal brand and a solid foundation for long-term brand and business success. And I do that by helping them have a positive mindset, create a brand marketing strategy, and take intentional action. And I'm the host of The Robin Graham Show, where we talk all things about business and mindset, faith, mental health, and all kinds of things to help people have brand, business, and life success. And I'm author of You, Me, and Anxiety. Yay! I love the last title. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the book. Who is it aimed for? Who is this book for? Oh, this is such a good question because when I originally sat down to write the book, I had teen girls in mind. And I have had a lifelong journey with anxiety myself. And I have three children, two of which are now in their early 20s, but my daughter is still a teen. And my sons had experienced anxiety. And now I have a teen daughter who is experiencing just a little bit. She's pretty she's pretty good, but she has a little bit, I see. And um, we're navigating. But I sat down to write the book for teen girls because I didn't want teens to have to live with anxiety as long as I did. And as I was writing, I realized very quickly that parents need help navigating anxiety with their teens as much as the teens need help navigating anxiety. And so the 
book became a three-part set, basically. So we have the book that was the original concept, and it is Navigating Anxiety for Teen Girls. And then we have the parent component, which is the exact same book the teens have, but each chapter has a parent section to help parents address um, what's going on with their teen. If they have not had anxiety themselves, they may not understand what their child's behaviors are or why they're acting the way they are or why they have these physical symptoms that nobody can seem to diagnose. And so helping them um, help their children, basically, and really help families navigate anxiety together so that relationships don't fall apart. And then the third piece of this is a journal so that readers can take intentional action immediately as they read the book. And I know that this isn't what your you know, target, you know, your your aim for it was, but as a mom of tiny humans who are, by the time this airs, they'll be seven and still five. Um, it even applied to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell you this because as I was reading the book, we went on a little snow vacation and The kids were sleeping in a loft and my son started crying like two hours after bedtime. And I went up, I'm like, what is going on? I I was kind of annoyed. I'm like, it's 10 o'clock at night. What's the problem? I don't know. And as he kept, you were in my mind as he was like, "I, I don't know what's wrong. I'm just crying and I can't stop. And I said, are you just a little anxious about being in this new place and, you know, being away from mom and dad? And he's like, yeah, that's it. That's it. And I said, well, then what, what can I do to help you? What's going to make this better? Let's come up with the solution. And it was really you in my head and reading this book of going, he, d- he feels uncomfortable. So what can I do to help him to make it better? Because he is feeling anxious. And that's what the whole book is about. So thank you for that. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, it, it applies to not just, you know, having a teen, but to even having younger children. Because I think, personally, I think that anxiety is more prevalent in this day and age than ever before. And it's starting younger and younger. You know, Michelle, it absolutely is. And I was about six when I really started having symptoms of anxiety. I had a consistent stomach ache. The doctors could find nothing wrong with me. I would just cry and not want to go to school. I was afraid of everything. And even going to birthday parties was a challenge. And But back then, nobody knew it was anxiety, right? So I went my whole life until my son started showing signs of anxiety. And that is really when I learned what was happening with me and how to navigate it. So I don't want people to have to live the same way I did for all those years. Not to say I had a bad life. I certainly did not. But it was more challenging than what I watched my peers go through. Mm -hmm. And when my son was little, and for people who have younger children, it is important to note, and I talk briefly about this in the book, but when my son was little, like he could not go to a birthday party. There was so much anxiety and, and it drove me crazy. I was so frustrated because I thought, why is this kid behaving this way? But we could not go to a birthday party and have him go out and do whatever games and participate in the activities and just be a kid. He would have to stay right by me and just observe. Mm. And there was no bribing. There was no coaxing. You know, I even went to the extremes of, well, I'm going to take your matchbox cars away if you don't go play. Um, You know, like there was nothing I could do to get this child to engage with his peers. Yeah. He was fine at school, but if we were not, if we were in a, a, an environment where there was a lot of activity, there was noise, there were a lot of kids, people he did not know, that he would just shut down. And that was our first clue that there was something more than shyness going on with him. And, you know, we helped him navigate it. And eventually, you know, he asked to play flag football and this was in kindergarten. And so he started to be able to branch out a little bit. And then the more activities he got in that were structured, where he could be a part of something, but yet not have the focus be on him, mm-hmm. he, he did very well. So it's a matter of learning those triggers and then having a strategy in place so that you can address them before they get out of hand. 
And we, I, I assume like it's it's with all kinds of of things. Of there's just it can be a variety. You can have a little anxiety. You can have a lot of anxiety where it's debilitating. And, and there's going to be like a spectrum per se of mm-hmm. it. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that safe to say? Yeah, it is. And you know now we will hear um, we because anxiety is becoming so prevalent. Um, we're hearing people speak of it more often. But what will happen that I've noticed is people say, oh, I'm so anxious, but they're actually worried. And it's not like Mm -hmm. I can decipher their emotions or I'm judging them, but it's, there's a difference. Like if they are um, going to go to, you know, say a dinner party, they can go to that dinner party and maybe they're nervous on their way there. Maybe they're worried on their way there, but they can go in, they can participate And then the anxiety or the worry dissipates. Whereas someone with true anxiety, either generalized anxiety or social anxiety, depending on the situation they're in, that feeling of worry or anxiousness does not dissipate when the event is over. Then more what ifs come into play. Like, what if I said something wrong? What if, what if that person that I met doesn't like me? Mm -hmm. What if they're talking about me since I left? What if my outfit wasn't okay? What if they thought I was ugly, you know, like, or what if I said something stupid and the what ifs will just keep continuing on and on and on. And they, it won't stop that night when you go to bed, you'll wake up the next morning and think, oh gosh, did I say anything wrong? Did I embarrass myself? Did I embarrass my friend? And it's ridiculous when you think about it, right? Because it's like, what is the reality of this? Is this right. rational? And and no, these thoughts are not rational at all. And so that I like to be specific with breaking that down that, you know, anxiety is different than worry. It, when you are worried about something or have a touch of anxiety, but it goes away mm-hmm. after whatever this event or thing was, that's totally different than someone who has a clinical diagnosis of anxiety. I'm glad you bring that up. And thank you for that explanation, because it also makes me feel a little bit like, you know, the fact that my kids, I can walk them through this and then we're okay at the other side of mm-hmm. like, okay, right now this isn't, it's serious, but at the same time, it's not like, oh my gosh, we need to go run to the doctor type of thing. Right, it's, right. It's, you know, something that we can all deal with. And I think, you know, they're also little. So new things can be scary and I get that. And I remember going away in sixth grade to camp and there was some sort of, we were supposed to get on stage and act out a play or something. And, you know, there were other schools that were there and I came from a very small Catholic school. So there was probably like 12 people in my class Mm -hmm. and I couldn't get on stage. I was like, there's absolutely no way I'm going to throw up. I don't want to do this. And I refuse to do it, which is really funny because today, like, give me a stage and I want, give me a microphone too. Um, But I just could not do it. And I don't know why that sticks in my head so much, but that's, that, that was my biggest, like, I can't do this. I can't go up there. Yeah. And that's, you know, public speaking is one of the most prominent, um, I, I guess, fears, anxieties that people have. And I think it affects every single person differently. Some people just naturally are great at it and don't have any worry or anxiety over it. But even my husband, who is a phenomenal public speaker, um, does it very, very well. And with such grace and ease, he's, he does get anxious, but once he's done, it's, he's done. He's not thinking about how did I do? What did I say? And, and all of that. Whereas like when I do it now, I can public speak like you, I, I welcome the opportunity now. Mm-hmm. But when I was younger, I was terrified. I tell a story in the book of how I actually left my doctorate program um, because I couldn't do the the presentation for the doctor of project. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, now that I have navigated all of this, and if I have the opportunity to speak about something I'm passionate about, I can welcome the opportunity. But I'll tell you, I, I can do it. But at the end, I'm still going through for days, what ifs. And, you know, did I do okay? what if that person in the front row didn't like what I said? And so it, I take things to a different level of, and that's just how, you know, the brain 
the anxious brain works. You get on a cycle and I use the, the Ferris wheel as an example in the book where, you know, you're, you get on a Ferris wheel and all of a sudden these negative thoughts come on the Ferris wheel with you. And the faster it starts to go, the faster the negative thoughts come on and the, there's no stopping, no, you know, no one, no operator is stopping it so that the negative thoughts can get off and positive thoughts can get on. So we have to retrain how our brain is functioning to be able to catch those negative thoughts and, and challenge them and change them. Like the example I gave of, you know, going to a dinner party, is it rational for me to think when I leave a dinner party and I'm just saying me, but it could be anyone, um, you know, is it, is it rational to think that everything I said was wrong or that people are talking about me when I leave the room? No, Mm -hmm. these aren't rational thoughts. Most likely that's not happening. Right. And that's the reality. But for some people with anxiety, they just can't stop those thoughts. So you have to really work hard to, when those negative thoughts come in, catch them and, and challenge them. You know, is this rational? Could this be proven in a court of law? (laughs) Does this make any sense at all? Like, I know that person. Do I really believe in my heart that they would be talking about me in a bad way? You know, whatever the the situation is. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to change those thoughts. Retrain your your brain to think on a positive, have a positive thought versus that negative thought. And the more you can break that cycle and convert those thoughts to positive thoughts, the more control you're going to have over the, the frequency of the thoughts, the level of negativity of those thoughts and all of those things so that you can become more confident with everything you do, every aspect of your life, even speaking on a stage. Now, this book is really personal. And we, we talked about that before we started recording, but when you read it, I, you know, we're friends and we've gotten to interview each other a number of times and, and work together, you know, without recording it. Uh, but there were things that I had no idea about you that I, I found surprising because you share so openly and freely about yourself. And I was like, oh, I am so proud of you. You've overcome so much. You share so much and you share your struggles and you know how you've overcome them. And I, I applaud you for it. So I, I wanted to make sure that I, I pointed that out because just wow. (laughs) Thank you. And you know, Michelle, I have to say, so, you know, as a person with anxiety, being vulnerable is very hard. And, you know, from, I I can't even tell you how many years, um, almost all of my life being perfect was expected, not only by me, but by those around me. And so that was the world I lived in and putting this all on paper was a total exercise in vulnerability. But I have I have to say that um, I feel very called to have written this book. I feel that there are so many people out in this world that are struggling and they don't know why they're struggling. They just think they're different or mm-hmm. weird or something's wrong with them. And the reality is there's there's nothing wrong with them. It, you know, they have a glitch in their brain. But their glitch in their brain is no different than someone having cancer or diabetes or heart disease or some other illness. And the the world, I think, as a whole needs to start embracing mental health, mental illness, mental health struggles, instead of stigmatizing them and judging people. And, you know, you know, from reading the book, there there's a whole chapter on um, being curious instead of judging. And Mm -hmm. if my, um, (laughs) terrifying experience of telling all of the dark things in my life, um, helps someone else be able to look at other people in a new light or help people navigate their own journey with anxiety so that they don't go down the route of addiction or death by suicide, then I feel like what God's called me to do will pay off. Absolutely. And I think that also the book, even though it is 
you know, teen girls anxiety, there's a component to it that I felt like it's the guidebook that every teen girl should have, whether or not she's anxious, because there's so many lessons in it that as a parent, we want to, you know, teach our, our children, especially, you know, our, our daughters, but they won't want to listen <laughs> because they know better than we do until they don't. Um, so I feel like there's also that that big component that every teen girl should read it because you do talk about, you know, uh, sex, you talk about um, what others are thinking, friends, you know, all, all of those other things that a teen girl is going through, mm-hmm. uh, whether or not she's anxious or not, this is the stuff that goes on. Yeah. And, you know, it's so funny that you say that. And it, and it means a lot to me that you recognize that in the book, because as I was writing, I was thinking <laughs> a lot about how I grew up and those things that nobody said to me. I, you know, nobody guided me on these things. And I, I look at my daughter now and, um, you know, I see how she navigates life mm-hmm. and how, how much more ease she has than I had. And I wish I'd known what I know now. And a lot of these things that I, that I put in the book, they're, they're life lessons that I wished I'd had so that I wouldn't have had to live the way I lived for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. I I totally agree. And I, I can see that, you know, you talk about values and gratitude. And I think that in this day and age, with so much online social media and everything else, there's so many words that are more prevalent than they were before. Like we never talked about mindset, gratitude. Um, it, you know, the, <laughs> these were all foreign things, even in the past decade to me. Um, you know, I wouldn't think about meditating. And yet our younger generation is getting to experience all of this now, which can be a really great thing because they're going to have this kind of like a consciousness about them that we didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's just it. It's, you know, when whoever talked to you about your values when you were young, no one talked to me about my values. Like, you know, I was like you, I went to parochial school. Faith was very important in our family, but it was more of a, this is what you're going to believe. And Mm -hmm. if you do anything wrong, then you're going to live with the guilt versus learning to recognize what's important to you and what your values are and how you can live your life so that you're aligned with those values. And I, I think it's important in this day where the the teens have so many pressures, you know, so many things that they see every single day that could lead them down a path that perhaps they shouldn't go on because it's not healthy or it's risky or, you know, a path that isn't aligned with them, but they feel they have to take it because everybody else is. Mm-hmm. So to be able to recognize what's important to you and then stand up for that at a younger age, I think is very important. And I think it could save people a lot of heartache and grief and um, who, who knows, you know, what else over the course of their life. Absolutely. Because I feel like I got it after I had kids and I'm really getting it now that I'm 40. And man, if I had in me, you know, 20 years ago, (laughs) what I do now, then I think things would be totally different. And, you know, whether we talk about values, confidence, you know, not taking any kind of crap from anybody, (laughs) Mm -hmm. it, it, it would be great lessons to learn ahead of time. And I feel like there's a big part of your book that does this and is like the guidebook, the handbook for teen girls, especially that they need. Uh, And for parents to understand that, you know, these are things that we need to talk about and you need to make your teen comfortable in coming to you. You know, you, you put out there, like if your parent doesn't, you know, want to communicate on this or you can't go to them, then go to a guidance counselor, you know, advocate for yourself. And that's a lesson that we all need to learn to advocate for ourselves no matter what age we are. But I can't imagine a young teen wanting the help, needing the help, and having to go through so much to actually obtain the help. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's eye-opening for sure. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when something's going on and we can't put a finger on what that is emotionally or physically, it, it becomes very frightening. And, you know, if we don't have someone to talk to about that or to share that with, it can become very isolating. And the more we isolate ourselves, I think, um, the more we put ourselves at risk for making those decisions that, you know, where addiction or death by suicide or, you know, drastic measures could occur. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that just as a whole, I think that we, we give kids that authority to recognize within themselves that something's not right. And, you know, we as adults, I think, could use this lesson as well, because how many times, you know, do you hear of someone who all of a sudden they're diagnosed with stage four cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't in tune to their body. They weren't in tune to what was happening to them. And I think it's very important for us to, to always know, you know, the mind, body, soul connection, what's happening and, and how can we navigate this so that we don't end up getting that diagnosis that's so detrimental versus being able to navigate it, get to the doctor, have something, um, a treatment or a procedure or whatever, so that we can then move forward it, on the route that we want to, the journey that we want to live on, not mm-hmm. have that, that horrible negative experience. So I think it's something that we all need to, to practice. Absolutely. And, and remove the stigma of it, you know, you you give some great examples of different ways that people can, you know, help themselves, whether it's through therapy. And now growing up, <laughs> it was very anti-therapy in my household, you know, um, yeah. and, and yet I love my therapist. <laughs> um, but it was, that's not something you do, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it, I won't even go into <laughs> what I was told about therapy, but um, to take away that stigma. To take Uh to, you know, if you need medication, then, you know, let the doctor prescribe it to you and be okay with it. Um, You talk about CBD, uh, not marijuana, but CBD and, you know, meditations and journaling and all of these other options and, and ways to, you know, get someone through all of this. And it's, it's fantastic. I, 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 I love the different ways you come at it and offer solutions for the reader. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Of course. And then let's also talk about, you include a component of there's Bible verses. If somebody of faith is reading this and wants to go read the Bible verses, but then you also say, if you, if that's not your thing, that's okay too. And, you know, there's affirmations in the book. It's, it's very all encompassing. You know, it's funny that you say that. So when I first started working with my publisher, she said, oh, well, th- we're just going to put this in the religious section of the bookstore. Like that's where we'll, you know, categorize this. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is for everyone. Like there may be somebody out there who is not someone of faith, but they could discover faith through this book and it could change their life. Or there are people who aren't interested in faith, but there are still applications in the book that Mm -hmm. whether you have faith or not, I mean, for me, I just, they're hands down. That's a huge component of my life. It's one of my most important values that I don't waver on because it's, it's how I find hope. Right. But for other people, that's not the case, but they could still learn and they could still navigate, you know, all of these other things that we talk about in the book to help them navigate anxiety, Mm -hmm. you know, the curiosity versus judgment, you know, giving yourself grace, forgiveness, courage, hope, like all these other chapters in the book, trust and how you trust other people. You don't have to have faith for that. You can, you can navigate anxiety by doing all these other things or living certain ways without having faith. So I'm glad that you point that out because I did not want to isolate any population for this book. I wanted it to be very all-inclusive that anyone could read it and not feel any sense whatsoever of of judgment or exclusion, that it is all-encompassing for everyone. And I thought it was great because you do include in the words in the book of, you know, if this is not for you, then, you know, try something else, do this, there's this alternative. Because I feel like a lot of 
the books that are simply the categorized as Christian, you know, this is it. And that's that's the only way that there is. And I like to be more inclusive of if that's not your thing, that's okay. You know, <laughs> there's gonna be different ways. And so I, I liked and I appreciated that you pointed that out that there are different ways to come at it. And, you know, if this is for you, great. If it's not, then here's this. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's no one size fits all treatment for anxiety. Mm -hmm. Every single person that has anxiety is going to have their own symptoms, their own experiences, and they're going to need different things. Um, One person may need therapy and medication and CBD oil. Um, You know, someone else may be able to just use tapping and not go through all of the other things that that someone else might need. But we all have our own chemical imbalances in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it's very specific to each human. It's not something we can generalize and and the same thing with our belief systems. We're not all equal in that either. And I think it's really important as, you know, we're talking about, you know, not judging, not stigmatizing, I don't think we can pigeonhole people into one belief system or another. Right. I love it. I'm so proud of you. I, I truly mean that. I The book is great. It's just, if you're a teen, if you're a parent, even if you're not a girl, uh, <laughs> it's something that somebody can get something from. You know, as a parent of little people, I got something from it. So you know, I, I think it it goes a long way. We need it in the teen section, the adult section, the parenting section, the children's section. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I I do a lot of podcast interviews and I've been on a lot of shows that where the audience is entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about this so much that, you know, even if you are not a parent, <laughs> you can pick up this book, I think, and get something from it. Because when we talk about even the entrepreneurial journey and, you know, with what you do, Michelle, with PR, like some people get very anxious Mm -hmm. having to put themselves out there and talk about themselves or any of that. And, you know, it's a, the, my five C's journaling method is, is something that anyone in any walk of life could use, no matter the gender, the age, the role that they play um, from a family perspective or business perspective. So no, I really appreciate that you said that, that it really, it really is um, useful. Yeah. Useful and applicable. And you're totally right about the entrepreneurial journey. And it, it, I really think that as we grow older, you know, we do start to recognize more of our values and, you know, saying no to things that don't align with them and being okay with that. And so the book really is useful, not just for teens, but for of any age. And you might need to reword the (laughs) the description of who the target's for now. (laughs) I know, right? I know. Well, there will be another one coming. Don't worry. Yay. (laughs) Yay. I love it. Right? We all have to start somewhere. Yes. Yes. I can't (laughs) wait. Good. Then that means more interviews together, more book launches. (laughs) Where can everybody find the book today? The book is on Amazon. So just that is our goal is to drive everyone to Amazon today. And then after the launch period, it will be available in independent bookstores and other bookstores all over the the globe, really. Um, So, but today we're focusing on Amazon so that hopefully we can get the bestseller status. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to go leave a review. <laughs> Thank you, up you. There. Congratulations and happy launch day. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much for having me. I really, really appreciate you. And if anybody wants more information, they can also just go to my website or the book's website, which is um, youmeandanxiety.com or therobingrant.com. Either way. Perfect. Thank you as always, Robin. It's always so much fun to talk to you. Thank you, Michelle. I am so incredibly proud of my friend Robin. And I know this book is one that everyone should read. So go out and grab your copy today. It takes a lot of courage to not only birth a book, but to write one that includes such personal and intimate details. I appreciate Robin sharing of herself in order to help others. And this book is going to help change lives. 
If you suffer from anxiety, know that you're not alone. Seek professional help if you need to. And if you know someone who has anxiety, be a supportive individual in their lives. Together, we can help one another make this world a better place.